Hello, I am Dr. Natasha Reynolds, and today I'm going to be having a conversation with Dr. Todd Essig as part of a series produced by the Psychotherapy Action Network, or CYAN, a global community of mental health professionals and stakeholders dedicated to promoting psychotherapies of depth, insight, and relationship. In this series, we'll be speaking to authors, researchers, and academics and policymakers, many of whom have serve as advisors to the Psychotherapy Action Network, and all of whom are concerned about the current state of mental health care policies and practices. We will be hearing what some important voices in our field have to say about the future of psychotherapy. Todd Essig is a training and supervising psychoanalyst at the William Allenson White Institute. Widely known as a pioneer in the innovative uses of mental health technologies, he publishes and lectures widely. He is an advisor to Cyan and has served on the editorial bo boards for Contemporary Psychoanalysis and JAPA, and recently co-edited with Jillian Isaacs Russell, a special issue of Psychoanalytic Perspectives on Psychoanalysis and Technology. In the aftermath of 9-11, he was a board chair for the New York Disaster Counseling Coalition NYDCC, providing free mental health care to first responders and their families. He currently serves as a co-chair to the American Psychoanalytic Association's COVID-19 advisory team and has been awarded Distinguished Service Awards by APSA and the New York State Psychological Association for his efforts. He writes Managing Mental Wealth for Forbes, where he covers the intersection of technology, psychology, and culture, and his practices in New York City, where he treats individuals and couples, almost all of whom used to come to his office. So welcome, and thanks for your time today. It's great to be here. I'm really happy to be doing this. Yeah. So we were, I mentioned Cyan, the Psychotherapy Action Network, and I first wanted to start off and ask, what got you involved in, in Cyan? Well, I got started um, because I knew Nancy and Linda and Janice, we met at a conference and they talked to me a bit about what Cyan was going to be. This was in the early stages. And it seemed to be something which, um, if they could pull it off, would be a real contribution. The, the future of psychotherapy is something which is, I think, very much in doubt for lots of reasons. And their commitment to psychotherapies of depth, insight, and relationship um, very much in my wheelhouse. It's something that I'm committed to trying to do. Um, I've been a bit of a forward-facing psychoanalyst trying to engage the culture in kind of a wider conversation and not just address the academic or professional literature. Mm -hmm. And what they were talking about in terms of rebranding, um, and in terms of getting the message out about who we really are and what we really do and the value of what we do seemed really quite useful to me. So I kind of signed on and I've been really impressed with um, um, the work that's been taking place ever since. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in that uh, <clears throat> therapy based in relationship insight and depth. And I'm curious, like, what is, what do you see as why that type of psychotherapy and contrasting to what? Well, um, I think that's a very politically astute and diplomatic way to describe um, what we're doing because there's a tendency to, among psychotherapists to do a kind of a bit of a circular firing squad. Um, you know, the psychoanalysts are upset with the humanists who are upset with the mindfulness-based people. And the bottom line is there's a particular vision of psychotherapy um, which has several flavors, and that vision puts the relationship at the very center of it. Um, it defines psychotherapy very much as, as a human relationship, not as a, a delivery device, but as the actual essence of what it is that's taking place. Um, so by saying psychotherapy is of depth, insight, and relationship, it's a way of both being, um, 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 both defining things in terms of the wider culture, um, in opposition to algorithmic or manualized kinds of approaches, which view psychotherapy as a set of instructions to be deployed independent of the relationship. Um, and by putting it central, by putting the, the relationship at the center, they were able to kind of define themselves culturally. And at the same time, um, and one of my favorite mottos that we're actually using on the APSA COVID-19 advisory team is that inclusivity is the new elitism. Um, hmm. So rather than kind of defining it as we're a bunch of psychoanalysts or psychodynamic clinicians, they broaden the umbrella to include more people inside the field um, 
that if you kind of view psychotherapy um, where learning about yourself um, is important, where the relationship is important and where it is something which is meaningful and deep and getting to the root causes and getting to what actually the problems are, which are inhibiting people's lives and causing symptoms, um, they were able to kind of, I think, do something which is uh, my version of the new elitism, which is being inclusive. Mm -hmm. I like that elitism is the new, inclu well, inclusivity is the new elitism. Yeah, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Um, so you talked about, I think you mentioned when you were um, describe or kind of contrasting uh, relation relationships and, and depth and insight and therapy um, to manualization. Um, and I, I know that you and your work have previously talked about manualization of therapy and algorithms. And I'm, it, it's so fascinating. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about your view on algorithmic based therapy. Well, you know, not being a practitioner of algorithmic based therapy, my vision is kind of, I'm sure, skewed. Um, but, you know, what I mean by algorithmic based therapy is that it is the deployment of a set of pre established procedures um, directed towards um, previously defined symptom clusters with a defined endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like, um, the, the the algorithm for fever reduction if someone has a bacterial infection um, is to give them an aspirin or a fever reducer. Um, in contrast, mm -hmm. um, it's the work that we do, which is to try to get at the root cause of things. Um, and the way to do that is the way humans have always grown and developed and changed, which is in an, in an intimate relationship with someone else. Um, sometimes those intimate relationships can be quite destructive. Um, and at the same time, those intimate relationships when kind of um, um, you know, you know, um, crafted with the collected wisdom of the psychotherapeutic tradition can be incredibly healing and can enable people to begin to kind of live much richer and fuller lives. Um, so it really is actually a, a real kind of fundamental difference in a vision for what the future of psychotherapy is going to be. Mm. Um, the future of psychotherapy going to be um, um, manuals that are deployed. And, you know, and a manual is nothing more than a set of instructions. It's an algorithm. Um, is psychotherapy going to be an increasingly complex algorithm deployed by increasingly less human providers? Mm. Or is psychotherapy going to remain uh, an intimate human relationship that enables the, the, the healing and the creation of freedom um, that we've always kind of known to take place. Mm -hmm. Do you see any utility in manualization or, or um, algorithmic based work? I think it is extraordinarily valuable to help reduce symptoms. Um, um, and it would be something that, um, you know, one thing I've said is that I would never recommend or want someone to go to a therapist who hasn't read the manuals. And I would never want someone to go to someone who actually uses the manuals. Mm -hmm. um, that I think in, um, in effective, in-depth, insight-based therapeutic relationships, um, you know, the techniques and the procedures that are parts of the manuals can and should be deployed when and if it's necessary or useful to do so. But to confuse that with the actual therapy is the problem. So yeah, I think there's a tremendous value. Um, and I think the researchers who have kind of um, done that work have done a great service. Where they've done a disservice is by defining the a piece as though it were the whole, the mm. defining a particular algorithm as though it were the therapy, but it's not. Mm, mm -hmm. the therapy is the relationship. Understood, yeah. Hmm. I guess I'm, I, I'm aware that you've also done a little bit of work with, uh, or focusing on virtual therapy and, and kind of the movement towards virtual uh, therapy. And, and I guess I have to, uh, I have to contextualize this in, I learned about your work before COVID, uh, before the pandemic started and, and a lot of that work. Before times, I think I remember <laughs> them. Yeah, some time ago. Uh, when this whole screen thing was a choice. 
Yes, yes, indeed. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, before, in the before times, you talked a little bit about um, the kind of the risks and uh, the risks and benefits, where I don't know if you talk so much about the benefits, but the risks of virtualizing therapy and, and what is gained and what is lost there. And I'm curious if you can share a little bit about uh, your thoughts before times. And, and then of course, I'd also love to hear how this has changed, how COVID has changed um, your work or your, your thoughts around this. I'm really glad you asked that because I, I'm often asked about that. Um, and, and, and the difference does come down to the whole question of choice. I don't think I'm thinking about things that differently. Um, I'm much more pessimistic and sadder and I'm acutely feeling the loss of the last nine months. Um, but in terms of the gains and losses of, and by virtualization, I assume you mean a human relationship conducted via the screen. I suppose that's one version of virtualization. Of okay, <laughs> that's, that's the first step. Okay. Um, I, and, um, we can talk about the, the use of avatars and AI and that whole thing um, in, in a moment, but I okay. just want to clarify that um, taking a view that something is better than nothing um, and making a point of focusing on the differences between what takes place on screen and what could take place in person um, is a common thread pre-COVID and, and during COVID. Um, Jillian Isaacs, Russell and I wrote a chapter in a book about on intimacy, um, um, about you know, therapeutic intimacy um, and how, um, actually I just got two um, books confused. That was a different book chapter I was talking about. Um, uh, this was a this was a chapter in a book on um, kind of cutting edge developments in psychoanalysis. Um, wow. That's embarrassing. Um, I should have read my own work before starting um, here, but yes, I got it wrong. Anyway, no, it's a book on cutting edge, and um, Julian and I wrote a piece on um, how the cutting edge of um, psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and technology is not the enthusiastic embrace of it, um, which, it, and even the uncritical embrace of it, of diving in and kind of opening up a worldwide practice or offering worldwide training. Um, that is actually what we call yesterday's future. Um, that's an expression of the techno enthusiasm that was more prevalent in the 90s and early aughts than we have right now, where people are starting to realize the limitations of what takes place on screen. Hmm. Instead, the cutting edge, <coughs> is an understanding of what's unique about local therapy. And that the cutting edge is understanding the differences between what can take place on screen and what can take place in person. And by doing that, by understanding and focusing on the differences, I think we're most able to make use of the significant potential um, technology has to distribute psychoanalytic care worldwide while at the same time not falling into the trap of assuming it's the same thing as what can take place locally and still valuing what takes place locally because it is something different. Hmm. I mean, one of the experiences many people are having during COVID um, as we're all now forced to, to be working on screen is a feeling of loss. Um, and that there is a need to kind of mourn the psychoanalysis we used to practice. Mm. We can't practice anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and if we don't do that, if we don't talk about those differences, talk about what's lost, talk about what's gained and really understand that, we'll sink into kind of a melancholic avoidance of what's actually taking place or maybe even a, a manic avoidance of what's actually taking place. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you see as a difference? Uh, how do you imagine the difference between a melancholic and manic avoidance of what's actually taking place? Well, I put those both on the side of not doing the constructive mourning. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in terms of the, the your, in terms of your question, um, I think right now some people are um, enthusiastically embracing what's taking place on screen as the greatest thing since sliced bread mm -hmm. and, a new, and, a, and a new way of living that is just absolutely wonderful because we have more time, it's more convenient and all that sort of, um, I think, uncritical enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Maybe labeling uncritical enthusiasm as manic is an unnecessary pathologicalization of someone's attitudes. And I don't mean, I mean 
I'm using it in a kind of a non-diagnostic, more kind of non-clinical everyday sense. Yes, I, I completely resonated both with the, that your term, the non-diagnostic term of manic and melancholic uh, experience of screen relationships since COVID started of this, wow, you know, I, I don't even have to, you know, change out of pajamas, you know, I can just meet with my friends or meet with, you know, uh, colleagues and and do some consultation. You know, all of that was so exciting at the beginning. And then I turned the screen off and it was just a dark room, a, a quiet room. So mm -hmm. both of those experiences. That moment when you turned the screen off, what you were experiencing is one of the significant differences. Um, well, actually two of the significant differences between what takes place on screen and in person. You know, the first is that being in person is incredibly comparatively rich and replete mm. uh, where the, the, the resonance and the hangover of actually being physically present with somebody, somebody um, is significantly greater than what takes place when you're with them on screen. Um, so the, it's so much easier to feel empty after turning off the screen than after leaving somebody in person. Um, and the other part is that um, when you're meeting with someone in person, the ending is so much different. It's mm. more gradual. There are rituals of closure. There's a hug or a handshake or a smile or a wave or a nod. Um, in therapy, there are the door rituals you walk through. People leave, they're walking away. Locomotion is something which actually aids memory and labels you to kind of process and kind of encapsulate what it is that took place. Mm. Um, so it kind of lasts and there's resonance to it. Whereas when you just click a button, boom, um, and the person goes away and you're left by yourself in your room, um, that's a very, very different experience. The, 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 the procedures for relational embodiment are different in the two contexts. Mm -hmm. And those procedures have different clinical consequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this reminded me, I'm mentoring someone right now who's taking classes in, um, in his graduate program. And uh, I, he mentioned something about how it's, it's harder, it seems harder to remember stuff uh, after he's out of class. Um, and, you know, something that he would eagerly kind of, you know, read through and eat up and, and talk about with his classmates, it, it just seems different to remember and internalize a lot of what he's studying right now. And that kind of- That's really on target. I mean, I mean, we know that salience affects memory. That more salient an experience is, the easier it is to remember it. And what takes place on screen is just not as salient. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, in Jillian Isaac Rustin's book, Screen Relations, where she interviews uh, patients and, and therapists who are doing work on screen and also off screen, um, the, the analysts and the therapists report um, characteristic, uncharacteristic forgetting when they're working on screen. And there's a greater tendency to take notes. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I never, uh, except for the initial session or two, um, take notes concurrently with the patients in person. Um, but now that I'm working on screen, I always have my pad of paper next to me and a pen, and I jot things down during the course of the session because I don't want to lose them. They're, the the experience is more slippery. Mm -hmm. just, um, it gets lost so much easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's almost like the, without that kind of like body experience or taking it in and feeling it um, in person, you kind of, it slips. I like your word slippery there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Part of it is the, the somatic response, but there's also attentional efforts. There's also memory parts. There's perceptual differences. I mean, when you look across the board, they're just not the same experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And, and to get back to your other question about the whole virtuality, um, the place where I was writing before COVID about the real danger is in, is in when, when we don't appreciate those differences. Because once the assumption is made that what takes place on screen is functionally equivalent to what takes place in person, um, we're in very dangerous territory. Hmm. You know, what takes place on screen is can be extraordinarily helpful. Um, I think as we're going through COVID, we're seeing that uh, that psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic processes do take place. Healing does take place, um, but it's a different experience. Um, 
Um, you know, in the same way that a, a, a couples therapy or a group therapy experience is different than an individual therapy experience, all helpful, all useful, what takes place on screen and what takes place in person are different. When that is ignored, then the slippery slope that I see kind of rushing at us like an in oncoming technological train mm -hmm. is that there's really no reason why the image of the other person on screen has to be generated by another person. Mm -hmm. It could just as easily be generated by a complex, big data-driven, AI-driven algorithm. Mm -hmm. you know, there could be the Dr. Reynolds avatar so mm -hmm. that you know, your computer program um, could be in fact providing treatment to 10, 12 people all at the same time. It'd be very good for practice. Um, huh. Yes, but, but, but just my avatar as you see it. Yes, yeah. but it wouldn't be the same thing. It would be some, it would be an image of you or an image of a therapist uh -huh. presented on screen, um, generated not by the other person, but by a program, mm -hmm. but by an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And there are some early versions of this currently. Yeah, the earliest version was that famous Eliza from 1964 back up in MIT with Joseph Wiesenbaum doing a chat, a little chat bot to kind of mimic, um, stupidly mimic a Rogerian therapist. Um, oh no. <laughs> Let me guess, did they, did Eliza simply repeat what the patient stated? I hear you being curious about what Eliza said. Ah, nice little reframe there. <laughs> Are you real, Todd, or is this- You enjoyed my reframe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it would just basically take um, a sentence stem of the previous utterance and attach it to a kind of a therapeutic cliche. What was frightening was, and the reason he ended up turning it off was that people who used it had intense relationships with it. There were arguments about who was gonna have private time with Eliza. Hmm. Um, there's a story um, of an administrative assistant getting very angry at him for not allowing her to have access to Eliza. Um, so with today's much more complicated technology, um, much more sophisticated, um, there are programs now like Robot, um, hmm. which is a CBT delivered by a chatbot um, through, I think, um, it used to be a Facebook interface. I think they've changed that. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it since, since COVID. Hmm. But it's essentially a, 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 an AI-driven um, CBT provider. That's a computer program. Mm -hmm. And if treatment is an algorithm, why not? Mm -hmm. If treatment really is an algorithm, um, then it doesn't matter what the delivery device is so long as the person who's receiving it learns the proper techniques and procedures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I like the way you said, if treatment is an algorithm, why not? And if truly an algorithmic based, you know, response uh, or Rogerian, you know, kind of algorithmic based Rogerian response was effective in you know, totally reducing one's anxiety. Awesome. That sounds great. What I'm really, what I'm really struck by is the idea that right now, so like so many people seem to be struggling. We're all struggling with the theme of isolation and disconnection. Mm -hmm. We're forced to be isolated and disconnected from others. And I'm imagining that if this was viewed, if, if a, a chat bot was viewed as what I can get out of a therapeutic relationship that seems to kind of cement isolation as, as, the, as a human kind of standard, um, or, or I fear that's where it would go. I think that is a disastrous potential consequence. I think a step prior to that would be to have having people view psychotherapy as something which isn't about isolation and disconnection, that it's only about the experience of anxiety, mm. um, rather than it being a both and um, experience that does take care of symptoms and also addresses more fundamental questions about human freedom, healing, growth, desire, aspirations, connection, loneliness, 
you know, all the things captured under that kind of cyan umbrella term of therapies of depth, insight, and relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it's it's both a redefinition of what it means to be human, um, but also be that that being done by a redefinition of what psychotherapy actually is. Mm -hmm. The fear that that's the, or the fear that that is how psychotherapy could be conceived of uh, or could be conceptualized in the future. And that's all people would expect from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be like having a, you know, you know, badly breaking your leg requiring surgery, um, and having somebody give you a powerful painkiller and calling it surgery. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It just gets rid of one of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. You still can't walk. It yes, um, I, I that reminds me back to your previous um, metaphor of offering as or offering you know. Tylenol for a fever, but if, if the actual, you know, dilemma is an infection or something like that, you need a lot more than just Tylenol. Which isn't to say that Tylenol or the painkiller aren't useful. I want to make sure all of my kind of algorithmic colleagues and friends know I'm not putting them down. I'm just putting them in context. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just now we've been talking about, um, We've, I said the word has left me, but I, I guess we've been talking about the, um, the importance of the discussion of what is lost in virtual therapy. And I think, or, or lost in like moving into screen relationships. Um, and I, there's a phrase that you used in one of, uh, one of your, uh, I think your Forbes article. Would you mind if I read your own work back to you right now? Um. I'd be kind of um, <laughs> humbled and you're tweaking my narcissism. So go right ahead. <laughs> um, okay. So at, at one point in your Forbes article, you, you made a comment that said, we are sleepwalking toward a future of artificial intimacy. And that was such a powerful phrase, artificial intimacy. I was wondering if you could expand on that. How do you see artificial intimacy? Um, you know, that's an article I wrote along with Sherry Turkle and Jillian Isaacs Russell. And the way we were talking about artificial intimacy um, would be um, this kind of um, technological dream that in a relationship with a machine, with a robot, mm -hmm. um, we could get everything that we would need in terms of our emotional needs, uh, our needs for intimacy, for closeness, um, for contact, for to get rid of isolation that in our relationship with um, with robots or with a chatbot, you can get what you get everything you want. And the point being that um, the sleepwalking part of that um, is that if we ever get to that unhappy point, it's not going to be because the technology is um, as amazing as it is in like Blade Runner, where the where the androids really are incredibly like just like humans mm -hmm. um, it's going to be because we've ended up expecting so little from each other mm. that the diminished experience a, a machine can give us is how we define intimacy um, so the sleepwalking part is that we're kind of not seeing that every time we um ask Siri or Alexa or Echo to tell us a joke or give us dating advice. We're kind of taking a step in that direction. Um, you know, it makes, and it makes sense. I, I mean, I play with my devices as much as anybody does. I mean, what, you know, got me into all this <coughs> is that I went online in I think 1986. Um, so I've been kind of an early adopting technophilic shrink from the very, very beginning of my career. But they're not going to give us what we want and what we need unless we start to expect so much less mm -hmm. than what it is that's taking place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does, does it, did that, I think I veered away from your question specifically about artificial intimacy. No, I, I think you're, I think you answered it. Um, I, I've, I was kind of going along with the idea of, um, or thinking about what you just said at the end there. And it reminded me that the, uh, there is a, 
a legislative push toward uh, something called, have you heard of SIPAC before? No, tell me, what is SIPAC? SIPAC is a, it's kind of like creating like a driver's license for licensure for psychotherapists, um, psychologists to be able to practice in different states. And this oh, is- The national license. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and it's a really exciting, like I, I certainly know my own um, psychological association is, has been working really hard on this and it's a really exciting shift. And I, I feel that I'm, I'm trying to balance this excitement of like, okay, so you, know, you're, you can practice across state lines you know, for the first time. And at the same time thinking, you know, I could be anywhere practicing with anyone and may never meet this person. Um, it, it's such a, a conflict. Yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about that whole national licensure thing for uh, you know, a couple of reasons. Um, um, I don't think it is in patients' best interest um, to set up a therapeutic marketplace where there will essentially be a race to the bottom mm. so that the only people who will be able to, um, the only therapists they'll be able to access will be kind of therapist farms in the middle of um, lowest cost states mm. um, where therapists are all sitting in cubicles making phone calls to people. Mm. Um, and if, we think that's not the future, then we don't understand how the marketplace works and how insurance companies um, already are requiring that telehealth be provided by people inside their network. Um, so it's gonna be a situation where the networks are going to be organized to provide reimbursement to a minimally acceptable level at the lowest cost state in the union. Hmm. So I'm not so sure it's in, and I, and I don't think that is in patient's best interest. Mm. I don't think that's in patient's best interest because it's essentially, you know, among the many consequences, it's going to take therapists away from um, any urban center where there is, a, um, where there are graduate schools and academic medicine centers, and it's going to essentially dumb down the profession, which, can, which is fine. Because in that vision, um, that's the algorithmic vision. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, a national license is essentially a step towards the algorithmic vision of psychotherapy being a procedure that is, is, is deployed regardless of the um, delivery system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm even thinking, I recently got an advertisement because... Um, I, I guess my uh, social media knows that I'm involved in psychotherapy in some way. Uh, so I got an advertisement for a, a I think it's like a journal that uh, is, it says do CBT on your own. And uh, it's a journal that includes a lot of different ideas, uh, I guess, different ideas to treat your own uh, dilemmas. Um, and I was just thinking, so instead of even meeting with a chat bot that's responsive to you, you could just open a book and treat yourself. Uh, you I could read your own manual. I think that's great. I, I don't think there's any, I mean, self-help, mm -hmm. interactive self-help, computer guided self-help, you know, there's a lot of suffering. And if someone can kind of be taught how to do a gratitude journal so that every night they pay attention to some things in their life that is actually, they're actually good and over the course of a few weeks, their mood starts to elevate so that it improves their relationship with their wife or husband or kids or whatever. There's, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's not what we do. Right. We're on the other side of that when those things don't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, to add to that, I, I think too that the, the risk, and I think this is what you've been talking about, the risk is when that becomes confused for actual therapy, um, when this, you know, journal becomes the actual therapy itself. Yes. Or psychotherapy, relationship-based, insight-oriented. No, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I think anything which helps is great. Um, but the marketplace is being organized to 
um, only value short-term symptom reduction. Um, and in that context, um, the, excuse me for being incredibly inarticulate, really bad stuff is gonna happen. <laughs> you know, <I> people, get <laughs> you know, people are gonna suffer. Mm -hmm. And I think the national license, the CIPAC thing is part of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a step in the wrong direction. Mm, it's a step away from the local. Yes. I'm, you know, I, in some ways, it's like a, I guess I'm thinking about the way that uh, these kinds of treatments, I think you, you use the word dumbed down, but the, the, the word that I'm wanting to use, right, and I see where that comes in, um, but the, it simplifies things, right? It, it really simplifies, it, it makes things smaller and simpler and easier to, to grasp, right? If I can just do this three-step thing, then I'll be fine. Like all of my symptoms will disappear, right? And there's something really containing and gratifying and useful about that. I think something that, um, that I'm, I, I'm feeling in the like national context right now is, is the, the, that people feel complex, like people are running into their complexity and running into social complexity and political complexity. And the answers are not a three-step rule to break things down, but rather to complexify things and build, like grow things uh, in a, in a, um, in a broader sense, like we need, we need to not just understand what's going on in, in you, it's our you problem, but rather your community or your family or the political system or, or that kind of thing. And, and I think we, we certainly see and feel that in the national context right now too. There's a push against. I, I really like the image of growing something. I would frame it slightly differently because mm -hmm. um, um, I think things are already complex enough and I, the, the, the contrast I like is clarity mm -hmm. to simplicity rather than complexity to simplicity. Yeah. That, we, that one of the things, and I'll use the phrase again, psychotherapies of depth, insight, and relationship attempt to do is to make, is to create clarity where there was confusion about complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if you think about something like, you know, putting a man on the moon, or a woman on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's incredibly complex, but it's also pretty clear. You give him enough oxygen to breathe, you send him there, you bring him back, and everything's fine. Mm -hmm. So it's both complex and clear. The task is both complex and clear. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your read of the cultural moment is spot on that as we're sitting at home and watching what's taking place or, or participating in what's taking place, um, there's a recognition that we are embedded in ever increasing circles of influence and ever increasing circles of activity. Mm -hmm. And it can be kind of daunting. Mm. Yes. And real, right, daunting and, and real and mm -hmm and can you make sense of it in the context of a relationship um, where both people are holding the complexity together and clarifying the complexity together? I think only in a relationship can you do that. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, I, I mean, the, 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 the American, since you've mentioned kind of our cultural context, you know, this belief in you know, the, the rugged individual, you know, the, which transposes in our context to, you know, the psychological cowboy, the, the someone who lets introspection hmm. determine everything they need to know about themselves. That's not the way we work. We're, we're designed to find ourselves in dialogue with someone else um, from the various earliest kind of parent-child, parent-infant interactions where the infant finds themselves by seeing themselves reflected back from the emotions in, the, in, their, in, their, in their mother's face. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in, in a relationship with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, some of that can take place on screen. Um, I don't think it can take place with the computer program. Um, and I don't think it's um, ultimately useful to eliminate that from 
what psychotherapy is and say psychotherapy is a procedure. It's not, it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, in kind of a meta fashion, I'm curious, how did, how do you feel like our conversation went today on oh screen? <laughs> um, well, you know, we, we met at the Cyan conference. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been a very nice conversation, but in comparison, you know, you know, after the conference, we were both walking together over to the post-conference cocktail party, and we had a really fascinating conversation about the work you're doing in China, some of the teaching you're doing, um, how infant development research ties into it. Mm -hmm. um, that conversation, I mean, this was nice, but that conversation was so much richer. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, and I think because we were in an interpersonal context where more um, more thoughts were being activated, um, you know, here in addition to it being somewhat performative because we're being recorded and I know, you know, high people who are going to eventually be watching this. Um, um, but in addition to that, I think the screen kind of um, makes it a little, um, it's, it's less rich. Um, there's less at stake. Um, there's less happening. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting here, we're not walking, we're not talking. Um, there are other things aren't taking place around. So I think it's a, it's an interesting contrast, those two conversations. Yes. Le what do you think? Well, I was going to say much less at stake because we're also not dodging traffic signals and other pedestrians and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but actually to, to follow up on that comment about much less at stake in, in this screen, really this screen conversation today, versus a real human, like person to person, or excuse me, real in-person conversation. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that just a, a little bit? I'm, I'm thinking, I, I remember you talking a little bit about um, some of the what's lost in um, not having, some of what is not there in a relationship uh, when you are not in person. Uh, is this connecting at all, uh, or should I reframe this? No, keep, keep going. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me just... Because um, you have an idea that you're not quite nailing down what you want to say, so stay with the uncertainty. And, and so okay, I'll just keep free associating here. Um, I, I was thinking about the... the there's, you and I had, had talked once about the idea of what is missing, that when we are in person, the risk, the vulnerability of being in person uh, is that we could have a conversation. You could, while we're walking down the street of San Francisco, or you could push me into the street, but you didn't do that. <laughs> um, you know, we could, you could walk away, but you didn't do that. And there's something about maybe what was not, uh, what was missing, um, yeah. What that's, didn't happen, I guess, that, that kind of creates more vulnerability and intimacy. That's so on target um, that the experience of a relationship is not just set by what we're doing. It's also set by the possibilities of what could be done mm. that's not being done. Um, so, yeah, um, it's particularly... Um, garish example by yeah I could have pushed you into the street um, um, but yes um, or I could have just been kind of physically intrusive or rude or you could have been clumsy or you could have um, walked away or there's like millions of possibilities that didn't happen um, that served to kind of create the boundaries around which we were having our conversation and changing the context. And we know meaning depends on context. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, it, one of the things that's been uh, a, a part of my life since um, probably mid-March is um, um, along with Jillian, I've been teaching once or twice a month. I've been doing these webinars on the conversion to telehealth mm -hmm. um, and kind of how to make it work, where we kind of describe the differences with the question of how to make this work. And one of the key concepts that I spend a lot of time talking about is affordances. Mm. The idea that different contexts afford different ranges of experience. 
on those different ranges of experience change the meaning of what takes place. Um, and I think your question was exactly on target with that, that the, 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 the potential risks in an in-person connection are radically different relative to what's taking place now on screen. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I think I think about too when I hear when I've learned about the the idea of affordances and what's um, different here, the risk or the vulner one of the vulnerabilities in in person therapy, um, perhaps the fear that the spoken or unspoken fear by uh, a client coming in might be you're going to you're going to humiliate me or I, I have felt. Um, I felt abandoned or you know hurt by by the people around me or people in my life. So one of the things that might not happen in therapy is being you know humiliated or abandoned in that in that space. And what a you know like a a, a whole body whole relationship experience it is to not have that to have that um, countered that like implicit internalized experience countered um, mm -hmm. this new healing relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was gonna say, even if that's, again, not what we're, not what we're actively, um, that's not the content of what we're actively talking about, it's also communicated in just being together. Yes, that sometimes the content of what we're actively talking about is there to convey genuine acceptance and respect. Um, and if someone goes through the world believing that they're gonna be shamed for how they look, how they sound, how they smell, for how they conduct themselves, that there's something horribly wrong with them, um, to be able to not just have that be talked about in words um, where they're told everything's fine, but to actually experience that with someone else um, is I think, um, and, you know, and, and Winnicott thought, <laughs> as we talked about the holding environment and the facilitating environment, um, absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how we come to, 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 to care about ourselves by experiencing the care and respect of other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Well, I, to, to reflect back to your question, I, I have really also enjoyed our conversation albeit on, on Zoom and not um, you know, walking down the street together, but I really appreciate your time. Um, Happy to do it. Yes. Do you have any additional thoughts that you'd wanna share with me or um, our audience? Um, um, stay safe and wear a mask. Okay, thank you so much. Okay.